In this video, we will take a look at how to estimate the VAR value at risk for a position which is exposed to multiple risk factors. We will be taking a look at a very basic formulation, one which makes a few simplifying assumptions. Okay? Let's begin on a very simple note. Let me assume that I have to estimate the VAR for a position which is exposed to only two risk factors. Let me call these risk factors risk factor 1 and risk factor 2. Once we have the formula for estimating the VAR of this particular position, we'll try and see how to extend that formula for the case where we have in general, let's say n risk factors. Okay. Let's begin by categorizing risk factors into two camps and this categorization is on the basis of the most appropriate way to capture or let's say model changes in a given risk factor. Okay? If let's say there is a risk factor for which a change in the risk factor is best modeled as a percentage change then I would want to place that risk factor in camp 1. Okay, so in this camp, I'll be placing stock prices and foreign exchange rates. Okay, if there is a risk factor for which changes are best captured or let's say modeled as actual changes, we would want to place that type of a risk factor into camp 2. So in camp 2, we will be placing interest rates and credit spreads. Okay. Now, what I am saying here is that if my risk factor is a stock price, I would want to capture changes in this stock price, not as just delta S, which is my dollar change in the stock price, but rather as delta S divided by S. That means divided by the starting level. Okay, So this is like a percentage change in your risk factor. You can think of this guy to be some kind of a return. Okay, Then if I were to talk about interest rates as my risk factors, right? then changes in interest rates are captured as delta R. Okay, Change in the interest rate, not as delta R divided by R. Okay, now let's do this. Let's begin our formulation by restricting ourselves to, let's say, camp one first. Let me assume that my risk factors come from camp one. Let me assume, let's say, that I am sitting on a portfolio, let me call it as portfolio P, which includes stock one and stock two. Two. So, two risk factors both coming from camp 1. Okay? Let me assume that the current prices of these stocks are S1 and S2. The number of units of these stocks are respectively delta 1 and delta 2. Okay? So, if this is the value of my portfolio as of the point in time at which I am standing, the change in the value of my portfolio, let me call it delta VP, would very simply be equal to delta 1, the number of units of stock 1, that times delta S1, the change in the value of stock price 1, plus delta 2 times change in the value of the second stock price. Okay, This is lowercase delta, number of units. This is uppercase delta, which denotes the change. Okay, Then, since S falls in camp 1, I don't want to work with dollar changes, I want to work with percentage changes. So let me do this, let me multiply and divide by the appropriate S in both these terms. Okay. So for this case, I'll be dividing by S1, multiplying by S1, for this case, divide by S2, multiply by S2. Okay. So this guy I can think of this guy to be a return. So this guy is return of stock 1, this guy return of stock 2. Okay, The point at which I am standing, this R1 and R2 are both random. I don't know what these returns are. The terms in these brackets, I can think of these guys to be the dollar amounts 
invested in respectively stock 1 and stock 2. See, quantity times price. Okay, let me denote these terms respectively by x1 and x2. Okay, these x's are for exposures. So, since R1 and R2 are random, let me impose a choice of distributional assumption on R1 and R2. A very popular, a very simple distribution assumption would be to assume that these guys are normally distributed. So, R1 is normally distributed with zero mean variance sigma 1 squared. R2 normally distributed zero mean variance sigma 2 squared. This is a very simplifying assumption that the mean of R1 and R2, they are both respectively zero. Okay, And this assumption can be defended if the horizon for which the VAR needs to be calculated is a very short horizon. Okay, Let me assume that sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared have been already appropriately time scaled as per the chosen horizon. Okay, One more piece of information which I will be needing and that is the correlation between R1 and R2. Let that be rho 1 2. So we have arrived at the point wherein the PNL, the profit slash loss, which is given by the change in the value of my portfolio, can simply be written as x1 R1 plus x2 R2. Some kind of a quantity number, that times some kind of a change number aggregated over all risk factors. Okay, let's do this. Let's very quickly also take a look at a simple example where my risk factors come from camp 2. Okay, so in this example, I'm talking about a portfolio which contains two bonds this time. Okay, so generically speaking, let me call them as T1 maturity bond and T2 maturity bond. You can think of this guy, let's say to be two years, this guy to be five years. So my portfolio has a two year bond and my portfolio has a five year bond. Let me assume that my term structure of interest rates contains only two tenors, the two year tenor and the five year tenor. Therefore, I can treat the two year spot rate and the five year spot rate to be my risk factors. Okay, let's do this. Let's very quickly calculate the KRO1, the key rate O1 for both our bonds the two-year bond and the five-year bond. When I talk about the two-year bond, it would only have a sensitivity, a KRO1, for the two-year spot rate. It won't have a sensitivity to changes in the five-year spot rate. That means this guy only has a single KRO1. We have denoted this KRO1 as KRO1 of bond 1 with respect to the first risk factor which is this spot rate okay then for the five year bond it will have two kro1s one for the two year spot rate and another one for the five year spot rate quickly take a look at the notation that we have followed a quick recap of kro1 this is from frm exam part one essentially it's a sensitivity number which is computed using this formula minus the change in the value of your instrument that divided by 10,000 and also divided by the decimal change in the value of your chosen key rate. This 10,000 is to make sure that we are talking about changes in interest rates measured in basis points. Okay, you can think of the KRO1 therefore to be a partial sensitivity number. When I say partial, it means that only that particular key rate is being shifted, other key rates are being held constant. Okay? The value of this portfolio can be written as V1 plus V2. The change in the value of this portfolio, very simply, FRM exam part 1, can be written as this guy. The change in this guy would be minus the KRO1 of this guy with respect to the two-year spot rate, that times the change in the two-year spot rate in basis points, 
and change in this guy will be KRO1 minus the KRO1 with respect to the two-year spot rate that times change in the value of the two-year spot rate measured in basis points minus KRO1 of this second bond with respect to the five-year rate that times the change in the five-year spot rate again measured in basis points. Now again if I were to aggregate these two because they contain this common change which is the change in the two-year spot rate that means I add these two KRO1s let me denote the sum of these guys along with the minus sign to be x1. So x1 times the change in the two-year spot rate plus let me treat this guy along with the minus sign to be x2. So x2 times the change in the five-year spot rate okay so this is what I have change in the value of my portfolio that means my profit slash loss is x1 some kind of a quantity number that times a change variable plus x2 again a quantity number that times a change variable again let us impose some kind of a distributional assumption let me assume that the changes in these interest rates are individually normally distributed again with a zero mean and with respectively variances sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared. Since these guys are in basis points, please take this that sigma 1 squared and sigma 2 squared are also in basis points squared. Okay. Again, I would also need a correlation number to capture the dependence between these two guys. Okay, so where do we stand? We have basically reasoned this out that irrespective of which case we talk about a case where our risk factors come from camp one and a case where our risk factors come from camp two for both these cases we have been able to write down the pnl of our position to be equal to some kind of a quantity that times some kind of a change variable summed over all risk factors okay now let's focus on this guy and write down what the distribution of our pnl will be since this guy has a zero mean and this guy also has a zero mean it means that our pnl delta vp will also have a zero mean okay since this guy has a variance sigma 1 squared this guy has a variance sigma 2 squared the correlation between these two is rho 1 2 Therefore, I can write down the sigma p, which is the standard deviation of my PNL, to be the square root of x1 squared sigma 1 squared plus x2 squared sigma 2 squared plus 2x1 x2 rho 1 2 sigma 1 sigma 2. That's what we have done here. And lastly, I can very well say this that because R1 and R2 are individually normally distributed, it means that my PNL will also be normally distributed with this as the mean and this guy as the standard deviation. Okay, so if this is how my PNL is distributed, my task is done. My VAR is very simply an appropriate z number that times my sigma p please note that sigma p is the standard deviation of dollar gains and losses okay so my var is simply this number so as we stated in the beginning of this video we would want to now extend this formula for the case of n risk factors for that purpose Let's just do this. Let's just take a look at this formula for finding out the sigma p. Let's try and write this formula in a, in a matrix form and then we can extend the matrix style formula to any number of risk factors. Okay? Please convince yourself that if I were to create a column vector of exposures, in this case there were two exposures, my column vector would look like x1, x2. If I were to create a variance covariance matrix, which in this case will be a 2 cross 2 matrix, then that matrix would look something like this. Along the diagonals, I'll have the variances sigma 1 squared, sigma 2 squared. 
my non diagonal entries would be the covariances and both of them would be equal okay so it will be row 1 2 sigma 1 sigma 2 that's the covariance between 1 and 2 row 1 2 sigma 1 sigma 2 that's the covariance between 2 and 1 both will be the same okay now this guy underneath the square root can be actually arrived at by doing a matrix multiplication it is basically transpose of this guy multiplied with this guy a 2 by 2 matrix that times this guy okay so this entire sum that we have written can be very concisely captured as the matrix multiplication of x transpose variance covariance matrix and x and now if this is your formula for calculating the var this formula can be easily extended to the case where we have n risk factors for n risk factors this guy will be a n cross 1 vector see n rows 1 column this guy will be n cross n variance covariance matrix and all you have to do is you have to do this matrix multiplication take a square root multiply it with the appropriate set picked at the right confidence level to work out your var okay this video was about taking a look at a very basic model for calculating the var for the case where you have multiple risk factors and this is the final formula.